Drawing Out the Facts, the Naked Science Scrapbook. Hello and welcome to the Naked Science Scrapbook from the Naked Scientists. This time we're answering the question, how does DNA fingerprinting work? If you've ever seen CSI or one of those reality talk shows where a man demands a paternity test for a baby he doesn't believe is his, you'll have seen the two most common applications of DNA fingerprinting. But what's actually involved in the process? First, let's look at how DNA fingerprinting was discovered. On September 10th, 1984, at five past nine in the morning, Alec Jeffries had his eureka moment. His team at the University of Leicester had been working for seven years to see if it would be possible to tell people apart and whether they were related using their DNA. They'd been looking at regions of the human genome called VNTRs, which stands for Variable Number Tandem Repeats. These can be thought of as a repeating string of genetic letters or bases, a bit like the same word written down many times along a line. In this case, the words are between 10 and 80 bases in length, and the numbers of repeats of the word can be as high as 30. You inherit these repeated sequences, along with the rest of your DNA, from your parents. But because the VNTRs occur within parts of the genome called non-coding regions that aren't actually used to encode proteins, genetic changes called mutations and duplications, which are copies of the DNA sequence, take place within the VNTRs much more often than in other parts of the genome. This means that a person is likely to have a similar number of repeats to their close relatives, but people more distantly related to them, and complete strangers, will have a totally different number and therefore different length VNTRs. It's these differences that can be exploited to tell one person from another genetically. On that morning in 1984, Jeffries was looking at the results of an experiment they carried out to see if a probe they'd created to pick up one particular VNTR sequence could show up variations in the length of the sequence repeats in the DNA of his lab assistant and her parents. A clear pattern was visible, confirming that she'd inherited repeats of a different length from each parent, and the world of DNA fingerprinting was born. After this breakthrough, Jeffrey's lab was the only one to offer DNA fingerprinting and they were in high demand with cases from all over the world until the process was commercialised in 1987. Nowadays, rather than VNTRs, DNA fingerprinting makes use of sequences called short tandem repeats, or STRs. These are similar to Jeffrey's VNTRs, but are smaller and stand up better to the degradation of DNA over time, which makes them much more useful for investigating crime scenes. So let's look at an example of how DNA fingerprinting is carried out today. The DNA from a sample such as a mouth swab, blood sample or a swab from a crime scene is extracted and purified. In order to isolate the short tandem repeats, a procedure called PCR, or the polymerase chain reaction, is carried out on the DNA. PCR copies or amplifies specific target DNA sequences. In this case, the STRs are targeted, increasing their relative numbers in the sample. The different length STRs copied by the PCR reaction are then separated out using a process called electrophoresis. This involves adding the DNA to an agarose gel and passing an electric current through it. Because DNA is negatively charged, it'll move through the gel towards the positive electrode. The larger, longer STR repeats, which are made up of longer strings of DNA letters, are heavier, so they move more slowly through the gel than shorter, lighter repeats. And so by running the electric current for a certain period of time, the different sized pieces of DNA will spread out through the gel. They can then be revealed using a dye to label them up, producing a line called a band on the gel. The pattern of these bands showing the presence of different size repeats is the genetic fingerprint of a person. These days, DNA fingerprinting is used to match suspects to crime scenes or victims, to settle paternity disputes, immigration disputes and even in wildlife conservation to catch people illegally selling banned species. There are some moral concerns over DNA databases, and Alec Jeffries himself believes that although a DNA database is in theory a good idea for person or body identification in emergencies or after disasters, but they shouldn't be held by police. 
However, the technique has allowed dangerous and violent criminals to be put away and exonerated innocent individuals over the past 25 years. There are occasional problems, particularly as such care must be taken to prevent contamination, but it's an essential tool in the fight against crime and in domestic, immigration and even conservation disputes. That's it for this time. To get the answers to more science questions, join us online at thenakedscientist.com forward slash scrapbook. Bye!